All right, the recording has started and this is the May 31st, 2022 uh, Rook community meeting. So let's dive on into our milestones. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have anything driving uh, a 1.8.10 uh, patch release. It looks like there's nothing in the board that's uh, that's actively being reviewed or, or worked on. Is there anything in the done column, Travis, that would be driving a, a .10 patch or we're kind of holding on that? I meant to look on that. I, I feel like something merged a week or two ago that would be useful to go ahead and get in a release. Just it, it probably will be our final 1.8 release and just say, yep, here's the latest. There's a couple of fixes. I, I think probably next week, we could just do it at the same time as the next 1.9 release too. Uh, that's what I was thinking, but I wanted to double check here. Uh, okay, so just do it, yeah, do it like coordinated with, uh, do a patch for 1.8 at, at the same time as the 1.9 patch. Yeah, it's just convenient to do it at the same time. Yep. Um, do you want to take a look at the done column here and see if there's anything jogs your memory on something that would be already? Uh, I'm looking at the commit history now for 1.8. Let's. See. Oh, okay. So we did have, I mean, besides besides docs, so we had we had to disable the docs in the 1.8 branch because of the new docs redesign, and we didn't want to re backport all of that work. Right. Okay. So we just disabled that. But since that branch is pretty much done, we can live with it or do manual updates to that branch. That was the idea. Um, Oh, Seb backported one last week that was about an OSD broken argument. I don't think that would affect hardly anyone though. So, so again, it's not urgent, but I feel like, oh, maybe this one would be useful, the telemetry. So we're getting telemetry enabled in Rook. And yeah, you know, we've discussed that. Did we discuss that last time? Yeah, we, I think we talked, you chatted about it in the last community meeting, yeah. That's right. So maybe it, I should put that in the agenda just to get an update on that. But I think for telemetry, it'd be useful to go ahead with 1.8 as well. So, yeah. But I think, yeah, I think I'll put June, let's put June 9th as a tentative. If you, or if you're typing that in already, you're like in. Uh, yeah, I know it. Okay, cool. That makes total sense to me. Very reasonable. Okay, and so yeah, 1.9.5 would be coming up uh, as well, along with 1.8.10. So let's take a quick look at the board there and see if there's any uh, major things to discuss or progress on on um, items that we'd want to be included in that patch release. On 1.9, I don't feel like I have anything urgent to discuss either there. Nothing's blocking the release in that column. Um, yeah, we got a few updates just out last Thursday. So I think anything more important, like updating this F1 16.2.9, that was included in the release for those, that default deployment version. Um, but I think otherwise, yeah, it was just the periodic release. Unless somebody else has something for 1.9 to discuss. It's nice to be in a stable state, right? Yeah, it feels pretty decent. Doesn't seem like it's too on fire. <laughs> okay, yep. And then, uh, yeah, we, so we have links to the previous uh, patch releases here uh, as well, along with when they're released. I think that's, that's a nice addition we've made to the agenda uh, recently. Mm -hmm. Cool, okay. Uh, yeah, and it's all right. So then anything else on upcoming uh, re uh, releases? Any Is it too early to start talking about uh, 1.10 or plans for that, Travis? Or I mean, Oh, yeah, actually, we should add that in there. I think with the, I merged the 1.10 potential roadmap and roadmap.md. And in there, I put potentially early August for the 1.10 release. So need to add the project board link, but um, yeah. to the 
really honest. There you go. Yep. I don't like uppercase B's versions. Like an auto, oh, I missed that. auto did that. Oh, yeah, an auto did that for you. So I had, I had to, I had to change. It normally really bugs me too. So thanks for fixing yeah, that. Yeah, totally fair. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so yeah, any comments or uh, questions from folks on the call then about milestones and releases uh, before we move on? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move on then to the community topics and questions. Uh, KubeCon Valencia retrospective. Uh, yeah, I think that um, I don't, yeah, Alexander and I were there in person in Valencia. Um, was anybody else here in the call in, in Valencia also? I know, I know Travis was not, unfortunately. Nope, I don't think so. Nobody else. <laughs> How did the uh, maintainer track talk go that was, you know, pre-recorded and did you like get to a good Q and A experience with it or how'd that go? Uh, yeah, I was definitely gonna comment on that. So, and um, basically, so Blaine and I were on that call and we were looking for questions to answer. And there was a place where we add a couple of comments for people asking for questions, but we did not see any questions come in and we neither were able to get live audio from, we didn't hear anything and we couldn't figure out how to get our own live, live audio after the end when we had five minutes time for Q&A, right? So oh, really? I don't know if it was the platform problem or user problem because we didn't have, we didn't figure it out. Did they have like people? And then before the, the talk session started, did they do like a AB check with you all or there wasn't anybody there for that? Well, we there we connected before. Nobody from KubeCon, from the committee or whatever, joined to oh, help really? us with that. Oh. Um, we were there was an audio check in the tool, and that worked fine. But it's like there was yeah something totally failed there. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, I wonder if that's like a, a kind of a lapse uh, in in previous years because you know the last few were virtual only. So they had like the entire staff on the virtual platform and, you know, doing, making sure that everything was ready and connected and all that jazz. And then for this mm -hmm. here uh, in Valencia, it seemed like that was, you know, uh, the virtual component of it was, was a, more of an afterthought. Uh, that was not the primary thing at all. Um, and a lot of people that were there in attendance kind of forgot about the virtual part too, I think. So it's, it I'm seems sure. like that was kind of a, a big gap or a lapse that happened with that change in perspective now. Yeah. The call showed that like a hundred people were connected, which I think is kind of the normal sort of attendance we've had. So it was good that way. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious to ask Amy the next time we meet with her. Uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. That was a common problem. Yeah. Did you see Amy, by the way, at KubeCon, uh, like at the event, uh, Jared? I did. Uh, yeah, I ran into her. In the city. <laughs> we were in the restaurant. Oh, really? Oh, nice. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I saw her. I, I went to a, a maintainer circle, a uh, discussion mm -hmm. circle event uh, on site there in Valencia that was quite good. Um, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, managing projects and, 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 and mm -hmm. contributing and helping the community grow and stuff like that. And there are a lot of people from upstream Kubernetes were there. And Amy, Amy was there uh, as part of like moderating it and, and running that, that uh, event there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I ran into Amy briefly yeah. uh, and talk, chatted with her there. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So ho hopefully, uh, Travis, that you know we can be in person for the Detroit uh, KubeCon, so the next North North America one, and then you can give we can give uh, our maintainer track session there live and in person and, and deal with that there. Exactly. We're all tired of the virtual option. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Alexander, any any comments uh, or, or feedback uh, from and from you and then Mike also on uh, the uh, the booth, and the project pavilion. Um, I don't think so. It's uh, uh, to be honest, it like the Rook and a few other booths weren't necessarily as visited as 
other ones like Flux and well, even I think uh, Crossplane. <laughs> um, but well, with, with storage, so it's more or less like a bit anticipated that's where, yeah, well, a boring project, yeah. <laughs> stable, <laughs> but sure, stable, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing really to add there. I think only maybe regarding like the whole events, it's like I think for some, like the first one or two days uh, where like the sponsor tr showcase was often, uh, I think I always had to walk like a mile to get uh, some water from a fountain somewhere. Um, wow. I, well. <laughs> But I think this has been talked about on uh, Twitter, if I remember correctly, or like, yeah, they had stuff uh, started with law. And... Well, it is what it is. Second day, I think I put a bottle of water from the hotel machine, which told me this year. Yeah. But nothing like Booth was there, so, well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'll reach out to Mike as well and see if what feedback he has from it. I haven't chatted with him yet since then. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely a cool experience and being in person was great and seeing some talks and connecting with people. So that was, that was great. And hopefully we can, we can do uh, even more of that in, uh, in, in Detroit. Detroit. Yay. Uh, all right. Sweet. So um, anything, uh, so Blaine's not here. Travis, do you want to address uh, his agenda item? Oh yeah. So yeah, like six months ago, we discussed deprecating the Rook NFS operator. I looked back, it's in the notes history from this, this community meeting here. And we hadn't opened a deprecate or added a deprecation notice yet to the NFS operator. I think we've given it plenty of time. There's been no uh, real maintainers stepping up to it. So we've already got this deprecation notice on the Cassandra docs for their that operator so the basically blaine has this pr linked there which does the same thing for nfs operator to make it more visible that yeah, it's deprecated it's there's just no community support for it and so that pr is ready to merge we were just waiting for the community meeting to go ahead and merge that and you know unless somebody objects to it or wants to step up for maintainership of it basically Yep. Any concerns there? If there's silence, I'll assume we can go ahead and merge. Yeah, no, I don't have a major concern myself either. Mm -hmm. No concerns as well. Always sad to see old code um, say goodbye, but anyway, that's what it is. Yep. Cool. All right. And I mean, there is. NFS support inside the, with the Ceph operator. Too. Yeah. So I guess that's what makes me feel better in that case, at least. It's not yep, like the future sure. totally gone. It's just in a different operator. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that, that's definitely an option to, to take and one that I would probably even recommend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, sweet. Uh, so, Alex, you merged in your documentation, uh, you know, re restructuring and, and reorganizing yep. and all that jazz there are a lot of re's um do you want to give uh, the community an update on that too well like uh, for the best case part would you just go ahead and open rook.io real quick go to documentation seth i'm not sure if you've uh, had a chance to look at it jared so um yeah so these are the new, this is the new design for the documentation. Um, it has a search. It even has a, like a night mode. Let's call it night mode if you, yeah. For if, for if you need to administrate a Rook self cluster in night, at night. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's there now. I think the, like the biggest part is done. Now it's more or less looking into rewriting sections of the documentation um to like for example the installation part making sure that it's well more up to date and um maybe the, even pointing uh, to like hey please use helm and like basically making the helm installation a first class uh, citizen so to say 
Um, and yeah. So the only those restructures or like rewrites more or less uh, would be a thing um, that would now more and more um, come in. Yeah. yeah, I really like the design a lot, uh, Alexander. I think that it's, I said, it's try the search bar. Feel free to try it. Try to try the search bar. Some yeah. obscure cluster CR setting, right? <laughs> no, I just uh, want to look for something more general to see what comes up with like volume or something like that. Oh yeah, look at that. Like right. the high level pages and then like like uh you know previews of those and then that there's more on them. That's pretty that's pretty cool. I like yeah. that a lot. I know that's why <laughs> I'm really excited. So thanks for all that work, Alexander. Yeah, it looks really good, man. It really does. And maybe just as a sorry for all the issues we had after like, having it merged, but at least like after KubeCon, I was a bit, well, I was a bit flat, you know, but, uh, you know, having an in person event was something uh, not new, but, you know, that's tiring. Um, yeah. Were you down? Tiring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, understood. Okay. So we have it now. It looks great in most parts. Um, if it's built, like maybe as an additional point, um, if you have a link which is to like https github.com, rook rook, um, the during building the documentation for a release branch, it will automatically replace the master or like a branch that it is on, uh, or whether it is in the URL to, with the release 1.9 branch, for example. So if you, for example, hover over the object OpenShift YAML um, link there, here, it's release 1.9. So it's automatically replaced during the build, which is cool. So we can just add the links to the master. Oh, yeah, branch. nice. Not have to update the yeah. versions each time. Yeah. yeah. Well, this um, is where we had a variable that had to be replaced with the branch name. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's nice not to have that anymore. No more. Yeah, it can just be replaced by the build. Yeah. yeah, this is great, Alex. These docs are, are way better. I love it. Oh. Yeah, cool. Really nice. And it was yeah, nice to cool. have it for KubeCon. At the same time in the future, uh, probably we with, with a big change that will affect the CI. I mean, there were, there were a few days afterwards where we had to track down the CI issues, right? So maybe we should... Yeah. Make sure everybody's online and available and not at a conference when we're in the middle of those changes. So yeah. we can track them down faster. But uh, it was understood and good to get merged. So not too worried, just for future, maybe we'll think about that. Yeah, no, no, I definitely agree. And maybe at least one last point for the documentation part. Um, I, I'll look into the, um, well, issue. I think you could even really call it. That is um, that sometimes the website is uh, linking to rook.github.io instead of just rook.io. Um, and basically, as far as I know right now, the fix would be to remove the AWS stuff or whatever is going on there in front of it. Not sure if you know more about that, Jared, but uh, there seems to be some, well, weird caching going on. Um, we're like so well as far as I understand, we use GitHub pages to host it, but then in front of that there seems to be AWS in some way. I think Travis, you looked into like AWS uh, at least I think like at the DNS. And well it was yeah. Yeah, well the DNS is in Netlify now, so I am not sure exactly how it fits together mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jared, if you go back to the docs page, you, did you close that or still have it? No, right here. Yeah. So in the URL right now, it's rook.io, but if you click around, does it turn into rook.github.io? Like click around uh, on some of this stuff or? I think it might happen if you go to the version selection. The version selection? Uh, oh, which, is that where it is? Right here, oh. this guy. Yeah. Oh, and then oh. What, click on some pages or something. Oh, it's still not changing. Hmm. Yeah, it seemed like when I was looking at it too, it still, changed pretty quick. Maybe here? Oh, there we go. Put it to, yeah. Uh, so it seems to be the version selector to some degree. Um, if that's just the legacy version least, selector, maybe we don't need to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, either like it's more or less like the thing is that if we have Netlify in some sort in front of it and GitHub pages as well, I'm more and more leaning to either saying we'll just use Netlify for the DNS control uh, 
and then just fully use GitHub pages then. So that we have one system, so to say, to worry about it. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just not sure how. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. look into that. Like it's probably yeah. just going to be changing the DNS record to just point to GitHub directly or something, or seeing like where in Netlify it's well doing some caching or something, I guess. Because if we would adjust the DNS record to just GitHub to like the root.github.io, um, GitHub pages would be able to host like to the normal root IO basically for it on its own. And um, like that's where the root.github.io is somewhere coming from. Um, yeah, it, it is kind of weird because like- It should be solvable, yeah. Yeah, because you, you look like the, the bottom left of Chrome, you know, like the, this is saying that it will go to rook.io slash docs rook v1.5 and then you click it and then phew, yeah, it redirects to there instead. So that's yeah, it's not like even, it's not like it's the version selector yeah. that has, you know, that, well, I guess it's getting it from a, a variable because now the version selector has, has that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's happening somewhere in um, cool. somewhere in like the build logic for the web, for the documentation, because um, the GitHub pages doesn't have like the you should be on rook.io CNAME file or whatever you want to call it. And I have to um, I think that that might be where like the uh, build system or like the documentation versioning build system is automatically picking it up maybe. And in the end, as it's small, let's, let's try cleaning it up and either get our pages or like, uh, yeah, well, that is simply easier there. Yeah, yeah, let us know what you find, uh, Alex, or if you need like any eyes on something uh, to when you're investigating into that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you talked to the instruct folks, Alex? Yeah. Uh, they seem to be offering like hands-on labs, um, which well seems interesting. Um, where you, it's basically like um, I think Catacoda is similar to it, where you have like a terminal and you have instructions where it's like, hey, now run kubectl create or something and so on. Um, and it, they seem to be able to do something like this. Obviously, we would need to create the actual courses or well uh, tutorials whatever you want to call it for that but um yeah so it might be at least worth checking out so i would probably just go ahead and check them out again and see how easy it would be to create these courses or whatever um, but this might also be um just a thing to go hands and uh, um hands in hands with the training videos which travis is going to mention as the next point that we basically have like the hands, uh, the training videos, and then like hands on labs, where the, basically it's there's like a Kubernetes cluster that gets spun up, uh, spin up for them. We can even attach uh, some additional disks and all. And, um, so, yeah, I, I'll, I have to further check it out. Just wanted to bring it up in general. Uh, if anyone has uh, had experience with that yet, and yeah. So instruct basically it lets us start a demo environment and have walk through labs, not just like have videos that show how it works. Exactly. So the people yeah, kind of like Catacoda, you said. Yeah, yeah, it feels like Catacoda when I uh, tested it. Um, what uh, what, what sort of? To, uh, uh, yeah. What's what sort of uh, like plans do they have, Alex, for like uh, you know open source community CNCF projects? Is it like something that they host, oh. like like a partnership, or like is it like a product that they or, you know want to sell to mm -hmm. to us as projects? Um, so at least from what was written by um, well Barry uh, from <laughs> Instruct. Um, here we go. Uh, Instruct has an open source package of 1,000 hours of free consumption per year. Is this something for Rook or Ceph, basically? Um, so it might be something. I'm, I don't know if they are already working in some capacity with the CNCF. Um, but yeah, well. Yeah, OK, that's interesting. So they'll, they'll give 1,000 hours. That's interesting. Over a year, this might be, depending on how many people would use it, might not be too, and like too much, but as I said, like I would check uh, check it out, see how easy it is to work with that. Um, 
has like hands-on labs where people don't need to set up like a minikube or something for us uh, on their own might be well cool for like the getting started guide as well um including like the training videos um yeah yeah i, I could see, i could definitely see the value of um the experience there i like i, I am hesitant uh to take a dependency on something that you know might not yeah. be able to fit scaling our needs scaling wise um so that, that that's my initial hesitation on it it's not the experience but the taking dependency on on a product basically yeah yeah, no, the same. Um, yeah, yeah. Travis, let's 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 uh, dovetail that into the cubeexample.com uh, training videos. Is that do you want to get into that and see how that might be related here? Yeah, yeah. So the at KubeCon, uh, a number of new learning paths on that site were announced. Uh, Rook being one of them. So if you click on that link there, it should take you to. I've got basically I created four different videos of getting started with Rook, and they've been posted and they're publicly available now as of the last few weeks. Oh, cool! And yeah, so the I mean I don't need to be the only one that's posting there. So if other people want to create videos, the idea is they're just you know quick tutorials. So pick, pick pick a topic and a three to five minute video is ideal. I think is what they're looking for. And I've got a list of like 20 topics that um, I'd like to get to and just keep adding content to this. You know, whether it's upgrades or, you know, details of different CRs or, or whatever. There's lots of things we can- Who, who hosts this, on. Travis? Who, who, who are the Cube by Example folks? Are they related yeah. to the CNCF or? Uh, it's a Red Hat property. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. But trying to do it without or inviting people from the community basically to host their content. So it's not intended to just be Red Hat stuff by any means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, neat. Yeah, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not a lot different right now than just if you found the videos on YouTube or you know, maybe old KubeCon talks, but yeah, hopefully they're more concise and to the point people can you know, be interested in them. So, did you um have we have we like disseminated this much to our community uh like you know like a blog post or you know on Slack or Twitter or things like that to promote it a little bit? Not much yet. So hmm. may, maybe it's my hesitance to self promote since I recorded no. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, let's see. Did I post it in Slack? I, I think I posted it in Slack uh, two or three weeks ago. But yeah, I need to. Uh, tweet it at least and keep mentioning it yeah and maybe we put a link to it from the docs and, and whatever but. yeah that would make that would make total sense i think that's totally reasonable for this as like uh you know as a, another resource that we that we share for folks to be able to get educated and, and learn and be introduced to, uh, to the project yeah, I, think, I think this is great we should yeah, just feel free to promote that a little bit more than than you have so far right right <laughs> yep cool yeah, let me know uh, if anybody else wants to get training videos on there and we'll, let's chat before we create content just to make sure we're consistent now we're creating it the common look and feel for the slides we include or whatever yeah that definitely makes sense and consistency would be smart there all right and then uh telemetry uh as well we talked about that briefly yep. earlier yes yeah, so i think last month blaine discussed it and so the design doc for the telemetry collection has been merged uh, by Blaine. And then we've got a first pass at reporting the metrics that, that we're interested in collecting. Uh, I open that since or since Blaine is out for a week or so. I want to start collecting that. So the telemetry will basically be collected starting with Quincy 17.2.1, which is about to come out next week or something. And we'll be able to tell what's a you know, the difference between a root cluster and a non root cluster in the Ceph telemetry reports. And then we'll see what version the root clusters are installed and what version of Ceph and all sorts of stuff the Ceph team is already collecting, like about OSDs and MONs and all the demons, um, how many pools and whatnot. But then also, uh, yeah, so that list of metrics you got there, that's where they're mostly defined what's implemented so far. Um, 
basically or mostly different versions like Kubernetes version, CSI, and Rook version, and then a bunch of cluster CR settings. Now, to get this data, uh, it apparently requires a toolbox command to go enable the telemetry. Mm. So the next kind of the next step is well, let's make it easier for people to enable this, so that we get more people enabling it and get the word about out about hey, we'd love it if you enable telemetry. It will always be off by default, but if you don't mind, we'd love to have you report it so we can see what clusters are out there, what features are being used, um, and at the same time, stripping all of the cluster identifying information. Uh, you know, we never report anything that's sensitive and whatnot. Cool. But that's yep. kind of the like overview it. there. Yeah. So we've been chatting with the Ceph core team folks who were working on the telemetry, Blaine and I have and excited to have this in place because we really haven't known what's out there in the wild for as far as work upstream but except when we do a, a survey which has been at least a couple of years right since you did it last year yeah 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 and, and, and it'll definitely be helpful to streamline the opt-in or enabling or turning it on uh functionality because with the toolbox command you'll you'll definitely end up with uh we'll end up with a you know a, a subset of, of a representative sample right so being able to streamline that, I definitely agree with. Yeah. So that's that. Any cool. questions? Yep. Or right, any other agenda topics, uh, period? It looks like we got to the end of the agenda doc here. Uh, folks want to add something else on right now before we adjourn, then floor is open. All right, mm -hmm. cool. So yeah, we can go ahead and adjourn here. Uh, and then, yeah, we've got the upcoming uh, 1.8.10 and 1.9.5 patch releases and just getting started on the 1.10 uh, with the roadmap, roadmap merged. Uh, yeah, so, and then, oh yeah, quick reminder that there is uh, the CFP for KubeCon North America is, uh, it closes on Friday. I think Friday, like Friday midnight type of thing. So uh, if you want to get a proposal in for KubeCon North America, uh, this is the week to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Well, good to see everybody. Take care. Yep. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.